اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وآل محمد وارحم محمد وآل محمد وبارك على محمد وآل محمد كما صليت وارحمت وباركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد all praise due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we thank him we glorify him we send our salutations to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam dear respected brothers and sisters in faith Allah has given us another opportunity to come together and have a discussion how to better ourselves, how to get more understanding of our deen and connect with our Creator. We are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to continue to give us this opportunity in our life to be among the good company so that we might attain piety. Uh, before we start, to just give a short description of our setting, our gathering, uh, first of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of His blessings and mercy, He gave us a place of worship as a community center that brings the community in the northern suburb together. Al Ansar Community Center is a center that the idea behind it we always say as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will say مَا كَانَ لِلَّهِ تَصَلْ وَمَا لِغَيْرِهِ إِنْ قَطَعًا وَفَصَلْ Whatever one does with the intention for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it doesn't, it will reach its destination وَمَا لِغَيْرِهِ Anything that someone does, not for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no matter how high it goes, in qata, it will stop, wafasal, and break into pieces. So this community center, Al-Ansar community center, is a center that brothers and sisters had in mind for so many years. Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to use them, to make them the purpose, the reason behind the ummah, getting somewhere that they can pray and also teach their kids the deen. And of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered their dua, accepted their intention, and made it easier for them to get this place. This place, as you see, is a rental property that can contain at least up to 200 people. It goes in two ways. This place, as we see, and the places behind me. In total, it's a land of 300 square meters. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it easy for those who deserve, for those who requested, for those who wanted to do something for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a rental property that goes all the way, almost $43,000 a year. But with the help, with the support of every individual among us, it is nothing. We hope to help each other to achieve our goal, hopefully, we have requested five years contract with the owner. And we are hoping after that five years, as a community, as an ummah living in the northern suburb and those that are affiliated with us, we will get something to buy and own it. May Allah make it easy for us to achieve that. Apart from that, our aim 
was to serve the community in a way that no one has ever done. Our aim is not to compete with any community. Our aim is to see things that the community needs that they are not being given. To be given to the community easy. One of the aim is to make sure that we create G Zahabi, golden generation, the new community, the new Ummah, the new representatives of the Muslim Ummah in our society, to be able to get the basic, the foundation of the Adeen, to be taught how to read Quran, to be taught how to memorize Quran, to be taught how to learn and understand and implement what the deen is all about. Alhamdulillah, we started with Wednesday, uh, Saturday, Fridays and, Sa and Sunday lectures, which is for adults. Friday lectures is general Islamic lessons. Sunday lessons goes with Bulugh al as today is our first hadith. Our aim from next week onwards, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, we're going to start the kids' Quran. We're going to start with the Quran, teaching kids how to read and help them also memorize. This part, it's our second project. Our third project will be the homework club. Our plans are, we're going to start homework club soon, which will be once a week. Students of all ages can come with their families so that they will be helped to do their homeworks that they were given at school. So the center will serve the purpose of dunya and akhirah. It will help us to learn our deen. It will also help us to help the youth to have their homework and their schoolwork being done properly. Another project we have for future got to do with youth counseling. That also goes with career advice. We also have marriage counseling. We have ladies program so all these for any one of you here who is part of the whatsapp group you will be updated for every single project or every single program that is coming on people kept asking when will juma start we said as long as we are not ready for juma it's not a rush to create a new masjid that is not our aim our aim is to create easy accessibility for the rest of the Ummah in the community. So if it happens that people already got places to pray, there's no rush for that. When the time comes, we feel like we need something for that matter, Alhamdulillah, the environment we have will be able to accommodate that. So we'll keep you as we go, inshallah. Our lesson today is going to be one of one hadith in Bulugh al -Baran. That is the first hadith in the book. First of all, Bulugh al -Baran is a book that was written some years back by a well-known scholar. When we look at the name, the word Bulugh al -Baran. when we say Bulugh, is to reach, to attain. When we say al balik huwa al-aqil al-ladhi balagathu da'wat al-nabi. Someone who has reached the stage of puberty, the stage of adolescence, the stage where they can differentiate between good and bad. These are people that we call those that have reached the stage of bulu. So the word bulu means to attain, to reach the stage. What of Maran? It also means objective. So Bulugh al is to attain the main objective of life. 
That is to do with our deed. When it comes to the ahadith, we see Sahih Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawud, Nisai, Tirmizi, all these kutubu sita we always talk about, they compile all ahadith together. When we go and look at other subjects in, the, in, 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 in Islam, we're looking at uh, in usul in the Mulfik, all these are teaching us something specific. When we come to this particular book, it was arranged in a way that it will help us understand the deen step by step from assessing water that is permissible to make wudu to the water that is not permissible for wudu. And it went on to even tell us how to perform wudu, how to pray, what are the things that notify our wudu, what are the things that notify our prayer. It went on and on in our daily uh, needs in our day. So this book, inshallah, we've started with the brothers' lesson and they requested we should bring it here. So when we say for key, someone who is expert in jurisprudence. So the person who wrote this book, uh, he is someone that is known in his knowledge when it comes to Ilm al His name is, uh, or he is mainly known by Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, who was born uh, and grew up in Egypt, in Cairo. If you look at his story, you look at his life, at the early age, his dad passed away. And he is one of the scholars that have what we call photographic memory. When he reads a page, within short time he memorizes. I remember they said he used a day to memorize Surah al -Mariyah. We are talking about multiple pages. So such a scholar who has sat down to compile a hadith, for us to take it easy and take the shortcut to follow our team. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and grant us the ability to understand the main purpose of the deen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us opportunity after giving us the knowledge, after giving us the understanding, He should help us to practice what we've learned. Because there are differences. Sometimes we learn we see the truth, but we still don't have that power, that still power to be able to practice what we've learned. Knowledge without practice has no purpose. So when we learn, we want to make sure that we practice what we've learned. So it is very important when we are in a state of learning, we should ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for us when we learn when we understand to be able to practice exactly what we've learned. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us with this. Inshallah, we're going to take the first hadith as I made mention. It's going to be a very short hadith, so that will mean that uh, we will not keep you guys for long. We'll try the best to uh, quickly rush through uh, the hadith. This hadith. One of the companions of the Prophet وسلم, came to the Prophet وسلم, and said, O Messenger of Allah, we do travel. When we travel by ocean, sometimes it becomes harder for us to be able to have enough water for drinking and also to perform wudu. So, Messenger of Allah, can you help us, advise us on this? What exactly do we need to do? When we are on the ocean, it happens that there is no water or we have just limited water to drink. Do we use the same water to perform wudu? And then the Prophet wasallam told us about this hadith. It is very important, brothers and sisters of faith, at any given time when it comes to some of this information to have what we call a reflection to try to look at Islam from different angles. 
when he asked the Prophet regarding this incident, the Prophet said regarding the water in the ocean, which means that regarding the water in the ocean. So the water, regarding the water of the ocean, Tuhurun. Tuhurun, when we say Tuhurun, ma'nahu tahir al mutakhir Clean. That is over and can clean something else. There are types of water. We have al ma'u tahir This water is not Tuhur. And then we got ma'u tahir al mutakhir Tahir al mutakhir that is a Tuhur. Ma'u tahir water that is clean. Example, you get a cup of water. There is water in it. You are happy with that. You know the water is clean. But then, milk was dropped in. Or oil got into that water. Milk is not nudges. It's clean. It's something you eat. Oil is okay. But here you are, this oil or the milk is in the water. This water is still considered ma'u'ahir. The water is clean. Khayru musakir. But it's not something that can, can clean something. What do we mean by that? You can drink it. You can use it to wash. But you cannot perform wudu with that water. The water is clean by itself in its own way but you cannot use it in ibadah you can use it in adat your daily mu'amala you can wash with it but you cannot use it in making wudu or making ghusl so this is the type of water we talking about but the prophet وسلم, he did not say the water in the ocean is tahir he said tuhurun which is Tahir al mutakhir It is cleaned by itself and can clean something else. Which means that if not because of the salt in the water, you could have even drink it. But because of the salty nature of the water, that's why you are not drinking it. But making wudu, you can. And the Prophet وسلم, went further to say, Al-Hillu Maitato. Anything that lives in the ocean, you don't need to slaughter it before eating. It is halal. The animals that live in the ocean, that dies. Of course, here we can see scholars' opinion, especially when uh, Imam uh, uh, Abu Hanifa al-Nu'man, he has classified some animals in the ocean as not halal. But here the hadith is a general hadith that said Hillun Maitato Everything that lives in the ocean is considered halal if, So if you see someone said We don't eat prawns We don't eat crabs We don't eat those sort of animals They are considering the nature of those animals As Imam Abu Hanifa al Nu'man He declares those animals as not clean so that don't eat it. But according to this hadith, unless you see that animal will harm you or have some things that can harm you, then you stay away from it. Apart from that, anything that lives in the ocean is considered halal. So we're going to look at this hadith, but before we do that, as I said, I want us to reflect. Look at the question the Prophet was asked. The question was, we do travel on the ocean. When we travel on the ocean, we have water, but sometimes the water is not enough for us. It comes to prayer, how do we perform wudu with this water? Let's read the teachings of the Prophet These are what the deen of Islam is all about. Drink the water, keep it for drinking. Islam cares about your safety. Sometimes the way people present Islam make it so harsh to the extent people think that subhanallah, 
Muslims are being put too much of hardship. They don't have freedom. They cannot do this. They cannot do that. But when you look at the deen itself, a deen, at the Prophet who said, Yusrun la usrafi. The deen is easy. There is no hardship in it. Allah is saying, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. We do not put any burden on any individual. So here the Prophet Sallallahu said, drink your water, keep hydration, don't make wudu with the water and struggle. So he said, keep the water for drinking. When it comes for your deen, use the ocean to make wudu. This is our first reflection as we go. So we want to understand the deen cares about our well-being more than we care about ourselves. The deen does not put hardship on us. When people sat down and create unnecessary burden on themselves, they should not put it on the deen. The deen itself is easy and we need to put those points very, very carefully. So when the Prophet ﷺ was asked regarding the ocean, he وسلم, said, the water is suitable for performing ablution or wudu. And its dead, which is the animals in the ocean, are also lawful, which is halal, without any prescribed slaughtering methods for them. This is all agreed by all four Imams. It is narrated by all Imams also. So you can see this hadith, all scholars agree upon, as I made mention, a nukta, which is regarding some animals, where Abu Hanifa uh, disagree with that and said, no, we will not eat this. Why did the Prophet ﷺ make mention of this information? We saw in Sunan Abu Dawud, Tirmizi, Ibn Majah, you will see all these informations there. But the most important thing is, as I made mention, the reason behind the hadith is the question of the traveler who made mention we do travel on the ocean and sometimes we need water. There are questions or there are sayings of scholars. As we go, we might talk a bit about what some of the scholars said regarding uh, this particular hadith in terms of what are some of their restrictions when it comes to the oceans and the animals that are in the ocean. Generally, we know if there is no water when it comes to wudu, there is something that we call tayambu. We do tayambu in prayer. That is understandable. But here you are, you are on the ocean. You have water, like you are on water. So there, definitely, you don't need tayambu. You need to make, you need to perform wudu with the uh, water, with the, with the water of the ocean. Now, the wisdom of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as we know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has given him what we call Jawami Ulikali. He will say one word that will have multiple meanings. So it is very important when we are looking at the saying of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, people will have different options, uh, different understanding from the same hadith. So the Prophet ﷺ, he answered the question regarding the water by saying yes, or he could have just answered it, but he elaborated further by telling the man that not only the water is clean, but the animal in the ocean are also considered halal to eat. The statements of the animal or the dead are considered halal permissible. This ruling is something that we call al-ahkam. So here, we're looking at some things in Islamic concept. We know what we call ahkam, the ruling, concerning the sea water and also its inhabitants. So not only the sea water, the inhabitants of the ocean, also the Prophet ﷺ mentioned about them. It is permissible for the faqih to elaborate with his answer if he realized the question, the questionnaire, is completely jahil about the subject. So when someone is to ask regarding this, if you are faqih 
someone who is a scholar when it comes to jurisprudence, you need to elaborate. Now also to stop here and look, we said fatigue. It is very important. We live in a society where an imam becomes a mufti. This is a mistake. You cannot just be an imam and all of a sudden becomes a mufti. An imam can be someone who is just qari or hafiz, someone who memorizes the Quran, someone who reads the Quran. That does not make you a mufti. To take those subjects, to start giving fatwa, you have become a criminal. A criminal. It's just like saying the dentist is a doctor. Yes. An engineer in the university who did PhD is a doctor. So you take the pregnant wife and give it to the dentist. If he tampered with her, he will be arrested as a criminal because it's not his field. In Islam, it's the same. We have faqih, someone whose knowledge is in jurisprudence to know the questions and answers regarding the deen. We got someone who is happy, our party, someone who is a reciter. He can lead prayer because of recitation of the Quran. But that does not give him the power, the mandate to start giving fatwa. The same thing applies to Muhaddith. We got someone who has knowledge of hadith. His is to compare and analyze hadith and say this is good, this is weak, this has good narration or chain, this does not have good chain, or this you can use it in giving the lead, this one you cannot. That is his field. And then we got Mufassal, someone whose knowledge is in the Quran to translate the Quran. So everyone has his field, but the moment you memorize Quran, you become an Imam, all of a sudden you become a Mufti, you're making fatwa, you should be arrested because you can cause issue. You will give fatwa on something you don't have knowledge about. So here you see, when Fatih, someone with the knowledge of jurisprudence, when is he or she is asked about such a question, what do you think of the water of the ocean? They don't just say, well, it's good and keep quiet. They need to elaborate depending on the understanding of the questionnaire. They need to elaborate. They need to look at the person's question and understand where the person is coming from and try to give the person answers that will not leave them to expect more answers later. So it is very important when a person or family is asked about this question to assess their questionnaire and elaborate in deeper so here we said the water is okay, that's fine, you can perform wudu. The dead in the ocean also you can eat. This is the hadith, that's all. But then we look at the scholars, how did what are their understanding regarding this? So if a person asks the fatih, if I sleep, in my is my wudu broken? Example. This is another example. Does sleeping spoil wudu? And then you say yes and keep quiet. And say no and keep quiet. What have you left the person with? Here the scholars of jurisprudence describe this into four categories. We have what we call an thaqib heavy sleep. Or you say an tawil thaqib To have, we pray Maghrib. You are waiting for Isha and you had a long or lengthy sleep that is heavy to the extent things are happening around you and you have no idea. Automatically, that your wudu is broken. Then not the sleeping that broke your wudu. We have what we call asbab. Okay? Asbab is the reason. This is just because you slept. There might be something that breaks wudu that happened but you were not awake because you slept deeper and longer. And then we got what we call also and now thaqeel qasir short and heavy sleep. This one also 
You slept very short time, not long after this situation. So it is very important to acknowledge that. All animals in the ocean, as the hadith may mention, considered halal. If that is the case, someone will say, well, the Prophet did not even mention fish or whatever or crab. He said, Maitato, the dead animals that are in the ocean. So let's say those mermaids, they say whether they are real or not, have human, have fish. Well, since they are in the ocean, we consider them to be halal. Because of what? That's what the Prophet said. Anything in the ocean is considered halal. So where do you stand? How do you differentiate? Where do you draw the lines? Alright? So this is where you that's where you follow the fuqaha. So they will elaborate detail and give you the opportunity for you to understand where you stand. So you don't say that well, if Mahmoud came out of the ocean, well not, we're gonna make sure that we eat it. Well, the Prophet said anything in the ocean is halal. So if you make any mistake and come out half human, half fish, we can only see the fish aspect. We're gonna finish you. We don't do <laughs> We don't do that. So we follow the focus. So when we look at that, the same hadith, what did um, uh, what's his name? Hanifa, Abu Hanifa, they don't go with every single thing in the ocean is considered haram. They don't permit shrimp. Whale, crab, dolphins, sea snakes, sea salt, sea crocodiles, all these they don't consider them to be something that is considered uh, to be eaten anyway. Dolphins, even technically, are not considered fish. Alright? But that is to do with Abu Hanifa and Nu'man. So when you say Hanafi Madhab, all these things they will not eat. They won't eat it. But then you come to the rest of the Jabu, the rest of the scholars of uh, jurisprudence, they will eat everything, okay? They also have some opinions as we can go. So they are in the majority, their opinion that everything in the ocean is considered halal. Apparently, some of the things in the ocean like the sea snake and water crocodile, they will only eat it out of necessity. Not necessarily because everything is halal, they start chasing crocodile here and there. No, they will only eat it out of necessity. When we say necessity, we mean the ruler. When there is nothing and they really need food, then they will grab those and eat. But in some situation, they will just ignore them. So this, there are other hadith we can look at regarding this information. The main thing we want to draw our attention to is regarding if we are to go, we can now look at every single animal and look, that, is it poisonous? Is there something wrong with it? There are scholars that say you cannot eat quail. There are those who said, is it from the ocean? He said, yes. He said, if you have it, give me my part. So we can have their hadith regarding this on the companions of the Prophet There's one of the hadith, they went on the battle with, um, even at that, at the time of the Prophet the army, they went and for Abu Ubaidah was one of those who were in this army. They reached a stage for some days they were only eating one date a day, no food. And then all of a sudden, a massive whale came to the shore dead. And they spoke about it, and they said, well, it is halal, we will eat. And they said they ate from the meat of that whale for almost a month. When they were coming back to Medina, they took some of the meat of the whale and brought it. They told the Prophet Wasallam, this is what happened, and we were there, Luckily, on our behalf, a massive whale was run up the shore. The Prophet said, it is halal. Have you eaten from it? They said, yes, and we even got some. And the Prophet said in that hadith, give us some. They gave those in Medina some of the meat from the whale. According to the Fuqaha, there are a group of Fuqaha that say, no, this is out of necessity. They ate it when they were away. And the other said, no, what of when they brought some parts in Medina? Those who are in Medina, they have food, but they ate it. So you can see how scholars will differ from one hadith, one information. Everyone have where they stand and where others will exceed. The most important thing is to start with this, we look at when there are 
misunderstanding in the deen. When there are misunderstanding in the deen, always remember one thing. Your understanding should not mean that any other person is wrong. Never make it in your mind that as long as you consider yourself to be right, everyone is wrong. That is not how the deen works. We look at the hadith of the Prophet when he spoke to his companions and said, Asam at this place. They were traveling in Medina. It came, they, were, they reached a place where it, is, it was Asam. They said, no, 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 no. The Prophet said, Asam at this place. He said, you should try to be there by then. This is companions of the Prophet He spoke to all of them the same time, the same place. They understood it differently. One group said we will pray on the way before we reach there. One group said we will wait until we reach there before we pray. But this time, we have problem in one masjid. Imam said, Allahu Akbar. He put the hand on the chest. Someone said, no, 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 no. Why is it too high? It has to go on the belly button. Someone said, why is it too low? It has to come in between. Someone even put their hands down fully. Those who follow Imam Malik knows Malik was praying with his hands down. Now, that by itself will create a big confusion in the masjid. But the question people don't ask is, if I'm even supposed to put my hand up and I forgot I put it down. What's got to do with my prayer? Qabli or ba'di? Did I lose anything that is compulsory in the prayer? No. But that by itself can create confusion in the masjid to the extent some group will say we will not follow this group in prayer. We need to understand when it comes to the deen, we have to take it easy. We have to take it slowly. When we understand something, we should try and understand where others are coming from. We're talking about one hadith. Here, Abu Hanifa said, we are not going to eat crab, we're not going to eat shrimp, we're not going to eat this and that and that. One hadith. Others said, we will eat everything, but when it comes to sea snake, crocodile and whatever, we only use it out of necessity. Others said, well, the companions ate and even brought meat in, in Medina. That means that we will eat anywhere we find it. One hadith. Interpretations differ from everyone's understanding. Some years back, when scholars of hadith, when they translate the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, that says, Alamat al from the famous hadith of Jibreel, where he said, "Antadid al ammatu rabbataha wa atar al kufat al awrata al ala tariyah shayi tatawaluna fil buryan." The scholars those days, 20, 30 years back, when they translate this hadith, they will say, "What the hadith mean is the cowboys. You know, these guys used to be poor. They look after animal in America, and all of a sudden look at them with tall, tall building. They do that with description of twin tower." Now when you read that same hadith, where is the tallest building in, in, in the world? Are you talking about America again? No. Same hadith. Analogy is changing. Now, when you talk about that, then you talk about the Bedouins. You talk about the people who live with the Prophet Sallallahu The poor people who have nothing. Now the tallest building in the Middle East. Same hadith. Different context. The poor people as part of the size of Diana, the poor people will be building. The pure poor people you know to be even walking, half naked, no shoes. It will come to a time they will be building tallest building. Okay. Who are those people that were poor, without shoes, without whatever, that now they have the tallest building? Are they the Aborigines? No, they are the Arabs. These are the reality. We're talking about this, when we talk about Burj Al Khalifa being the tallest building, there is a contract now that is going on in Saudi Arabia that is building tallest, more than the one in Burj Al Khalifa. That means, if today we use Burj Al Khalifa, 
as our evidence. Tomorrow we're going to even take the evidence back to the city where the Prophet Salaam is in the most one. So when we talk, when you take a scholar's uh, interpretation of this hadith 30 years back, and now you saw what is in Middle East, are you going to condemn the previous scholar and say they don't know what they're talking about? So we need to be very careful the way we condemn. It is very important as a Muslim to learn to understand people, learn to live with people. The Prophet wasallam, he brought people together. He never divided them. When the companions were saying to the Prophet Ya Rasulullah, let's kill Abdullah ibn Salud. He is hypocrite. Everyone knows him in Medina. Allah himself revealed his secret. Let's finish him. He's a poison among the Muslim woman. The Prophet knew killing him was fine. The Prophet knew this guy can create division. But he said, let's look at the people that fought us some years back. The people in Mecca. Let's, let's, let's see our own back door, our backyard. The Jew that are living with us in Medina. When we are to start to kill our own people, just because they are not doing the right thing, what do you think people will say? Now they are killing their own people. He knew he is hypocrite. Allah has revealed, but he said, leave him. Why is it that you pray facing Qibla? Someone next to you, the same Qibla. Quran, the same Quran. Prophet, the same Prophet. But you have issue with him because of the way he even lifts his hand, whether up on the chest or below the belly button or in the middle. You have problem with that. Why is it that when you go to the masjid to pray, you don't face Allah and communicate with Allah, but you spend your time and energy assessing the Imam if his recitation is good or not? Why is it that you went to pray, you are supposed to be communicating with Allah, you leave all that and start to look at who is doing what in the masjid. So you finish the prayer, go and sit down and say, Subhanallah, guess this person. This is how I saw him pray. You are doing the same prayer at the same time. You have stopped your prayer and spent your time and energy assessing people in prayer. The Prophet is saying, Man shagala bimana yani yani. Whoever spent time, energy, concentrating on what does not concern them, what concerns them will bypass them. So we need to start thinking. We need to start giving excuses for people, but not to presume and judge and push them away. One hadith, different opinions of scholars. And you can go on and on. Everyone has their own way and how and why they said this thing is not permitted. The most important thing is the deen is what matters. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said in the Quran in Surah Al Ma'idah regarding things that are permitted. And He made mention of anything that is in the ocean is permitted as well. And also we need to be careful the way we condemn each other when it comes to uh, this sort of uh, information that we made mention. When it comes to the Sharia of the Prophet Sallallahu or this deen, there are some things that are straightforward. When we talk about big, everyone knows that. There's no nothing you can justify. It's not like, okay, you can say Bismillah and slaughter big and then it changes it. No. There are things they are obvious. These are straightforward. These are the ways in which you assess the deal. Our next note of uh, ref uh, reflection is this. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put Adam in Jannah, when he put Adam in Jannah, he said to him, he can eat everything in Jannah, everything except one tree, from one tree only. We are trying to look at percentage here, how Islam works. 
when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said we can eat he made specifically said we cannot eat the swine we cannot just eat the pig we are looking at percentage here we are not talking about what we can eat but the way we slaughter it we are not talking about the things that are makhu we are talking about what has been made haram we are allowed to drink and Allah said don't just drink things that are alcoholic or something that is intoxicant in general it tells you that Islam has given you more free will more free will it's not like don't eat everything except this it's rather eat everything except this so this are the way we try to look at the gym we know of course when it comes to the pig we don't need there are a lot of stories regarding that from books that are written some years back there are those who said well the pig was not naturally part of what Allah has created in the beginning of the world I don't know whether some of you have read that they said this happened in the ark of Nuh when they were traveling each animal were in twos and then the elephant was lying down when he got up elephant does not lay in for your information but in this narration or this story there were two eggs under the elephant and they hatched and became the pig because at that time in the in the ark of Nuh they've been going to the toilet and there is no nowhere to empty it so this animal came and they ate all the feces so Allah said well they are just there as a dirty animal and don't eat them we're not interested in that Allah said don't eat pig that is what matters to us it doesn't matter when they were created how they were created we don't need to know whether they are good or bad some people will say well 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 because the pigs that are grown and eating pieces are different from those that are in the farm eating vegetables. All this we are not interested in that. As a Muslim, we go back to the Quran. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in the ending of Surah Al-Baqarah? What are they saying? This is what concerns us. Allah said, don't. We say, Samina wa ta'ala. This is the alama of a believer. We, we hear Allah says, we follow. That's it. It doesn't matter. No matter what the pig can offer. Allah said that we can't don't eat that is enough for us. We stop them. So we don't need any analogy. Ah, it does not have a name to slaughter. It doesn't matter. All these are stories. We don't need those sort of excuses. Because there are two things here. In that same verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described and asked us to make dua for protection against some people. One group of people who always change and twist what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked them to do. One group of people who want to do extraordinary to the extent that they do it the wrong way. No. Some people will say, I'm not getting married. I want to spend my time and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you have more iman more than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? No. You don't. Your iman cannot even compare. Well, for your information, getting married is also an event because that is where the challenge is. You want to go home, they said, well, if you don't come early, we change the door lock. I know someone here who requested for the masjid key because he, they changed the door lock at home, he cannot get back home. <laughs> so, for you to go through these challenges, it is a bad. Eh? It is a bad. These are the realities when it comes to life. You cannot run away from the reality and say that you are doing any bad. The easy way is not to get married. Anyone who is married before, he knows the difference between getting married and not getting married. The easiest way in life is not to get married. Some people, if they are, if they are get the opportunity to go off of marriage for about two, three years to have a relax and come back, they will do that. I know someone here who is happy that he's, he's a bachelor at the moment. 
So in reality, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gave us the deen. The Prophet ﷺ, he understood the deen more than us. The companions of the Prophet ﷺ came to him and said, Ya Rasulullah, I don't want to sleep. I don't want to get married. I want to have enough time to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This guy would say, I don't want to have any spare day. I want to fast every single day. The Prophet ﷺ said, I have Iman more than you. I do get married. That is part of my sunnah. I sleep at night. I don't pray all night. I eat today. Sometimes I fast. Sometimes I eat. The best of ibadah is the ibadah of Dawood alayhi salam. He fasts today. He pray tomorrow. He sleeps today. Tomorrow he pray all night. If you are with me, you follow my deep, my sunnah. If you don't follow my sunnah, you are not part of it. So for someone to say that, like the Rahman Rahman you. They said that we, uh, that we are not going to get married. We just want to devote our time in worshiping Allah. It's a lie. Allah, if Allah wants you to do that, He would have brought the angels to do that. They are better than you if it comes to that. They are a thousand times better than you if it comes to that. But Allah wants to be proud of us with this weakness of ours, with these challenges that we go through. We are able to still spare time and say Allah Akbar. That is enough for Allah. We cannot worship Allah more than anything else. We can't. We don't have the power. We don't have that iman. We cannot. But for us to do all these wrong things, to make mistakes here and there, out of our weakness, today we pray, tomorrow we don't, or we pray, we are not praying properly. But we still always have back in our mind, Allah is our focus. We still want to worship Allah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is proud of us. He will tell the angels as he told them before. When he said, khalifa, When I'm going to bring someone on earth, the angels said, fiha wa fiha wa Are you going to bring someone on earth who is going to be corrupt, fight, shed blood? While we are going to worship you and praise you, they know they can do that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Inni ma la I know what you don't know. I know what you don't know. Allah created us. We came here. We committed mischief. We fought each other. We shed blood. Exactly what the angel says. Are we telling Allah the angels know better than him? No. So with all these mistakes, when we come back to Allah, when we come back to Allah sincerely, mukhlisin, lahuddin, when we come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is so proud of us that He will call the angels and say, look at my servant. That's why the Prophet said, if you make tawbah, when you repent, sincere repentance, Allah is more happier to you than you being happy that you get that opportunity. Allah is so happy to you to the extent the Prophet described it by saying, look, when you make tawbah, Allah is happy with you more than a person traveling in the desert with all his animal, with all his food and belongings on a camel. When he got tired and rested somewhere before he woke up, the camel is gone. He looked everywhere, he couldn't find the camel. Water, everything is on it. He knew he is dying. So let me just go under the tree, relax there until death take me. This person is in this situation, fall asleep. To open the eye, the animal is back with everything on top of it. Out of joy, out of happiness. He said, oh Allah, I am your Lord and you are my servant. This is a big mistake. He did. But out of happiness, the Prophet said, Allah is more happier than that servant when we make tawbah to him. Why Allah is ready to forgive our sins, but we by ourselves, we are pushing each other from Allah's mercy. Who has committed a sin among us like Fir'aun? Who has committed a sin like Fir'aun? Fir'aun is the one who did what even Shaitan has not done. 
That's why anytime when we talk, we raise our hands up and say, our friends from Egypt are amazing. Yes, Pharaoh is the one who boasts, Ana Rabbukum Not I am your Lord, no. There should be another Lord, I don't have a problem with that. But I'm the highest one. That is what Pharaoh did. Wallah, Shaitan will not do that. Shaitan believe in Allah sincerely. Even today, Shaitan believe in Allah. But my Egyptian friend said this. Ana Rabbukum Ala. When Pharaoh was dying, he knew now it's real. What did he say? I want to be Rabbi Musa wa Harun. I believe in the Lord of Musa and Harun. Allah said to uh, Jibreel, quickly stop this guy because if he repeat that word, I will answer his God. This is mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If he repeat that word, I will answer his Tawbah. And here you are, your friend, because of one mistake or two, you've already condemned he's going to Jahannam. Like there's no way out. Allah is opening the door of Rahma, you are just opening the doors of Jahannam, putting people in it. Where do we get this? Call people towards the Lord with wisdom, when more is it hasana, with good speech, wajadi, even if it comes to not argument, debate, wajadi billeti here asana. Use the best of words. So let's encourage each other. People will have mistakes. You can see it with your own eyes. The most important thing is get people together, don't push them away. This hadith, one, a different understanding. So where do we stand? We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the understanding and open our heart to see the reality and follow. Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqa wa zukna tiba'a wa arina al-baqila baqila wa zukna ishtinaba Allahumma anta bihajatina alimu wa ala qadaiha qadiru wa huwa alayka yasiru fa mudana la bi qadaiha ya akram al-akramin wa ya ajwad al-ajwadin wa ya sami' al-nisab amin subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yusifun wa salamu ala al-mursalim wa alhamdulillah rabbil alameen وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا